delighted that uh, Atul Grover is here and joining us for this presidential lecture. Um, obviously, uh, policy is really uh, a, a critical need in the state of Texas. We haven't been uh, as vocal as we probably should have been. Um, and so this is part of the reason uh, we are starting a, a health policy institute at Baylor for this very specific reason to try to address the need to respond to legislation, to advocate for legislation, and to constantly be assessing the quality of health care uh, that our city and state and the country provides. Uh, to sort of kick that off, we're delighted that uh, Atul could join us. He's the chief public policy officer at the AAMC. Uh, he has been there, I think, for about eight eight years or so, uh, started off in, in in HRSA and did a uh, assessment on workforce, has been uh, a senior consultant around health finance. And uh, I enjoy going, every time I'm at the AAMC, the one session I always go to is his session, <laughs> anytime he's talking, because uh, he's an incredibly articulate advocate for academic medical centers. Um, from everything from workforce to graduate medical ed education to physician payments. Uh, the AAMC serves an incredibly important role for us, uh, and it's people like Atul who are the voice of our advocacy. Uh, he has had some great publications, uh, ones about NIH funding. Uh, there is one that I always pull out on his workforce uh, uh, studies. So we're just delighted to have you here and really just would like to have you. Thanks, thanks, Atul. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's uh, really the first time I've had a chance to spend um, any significant time in Houston and at TMC, and it's just very impressive and overwhelming. Um, I got to say that uh, you know I had no idea that you really are the largest medical center in the world, and um, it's great that you can do what you do. And I just wanted to talk a little bit today about, particularly as you set up this new policy institute, what are the kind of things that you need to be dealing with um, on a day-to-day -day basis, challenges that aren't going to go away anytime soon. Um, and a lot of them are going to be kind of perennial challenges that get tweaked back and forth, and I know it feels like we're in a particularly difficult time in terms of political situations in Washington and in your own state house sometimes um, where not much is getting resolved. Eventually people will get to the work at hand because there's no choice. And so I thought I would talk a little bit about kind of how policy gets made and shaped, how it affects you here even though you may not notice on a day-to-day -day basis unless you're plugged into uh, these kind of discussions, but it does affect you, and you have an opportunity, and I would say an obligation, to make sure that you shape policy in the future so that it benefits you, your missions, and particularly the patients uh, that you serve who are counting on you to be their advocates, not just in the exam room or at the, at the bedside or at the bench, but really in society at large. And so we can talk about policy from a federal perspective, which is mostly what I'll focus on, that is, what, what happens in Washington and how does that affect you? Uh, right now, nothing's happening in Washington, and that may still affect you. Um, so either way, uh, it, it can be a, a challenge and it can be frustrating. And I think if you look at um, polls of Americans and their overall job approval satisfaction for Congress, um, it's 13 uh, percent, ranges between 9 and 13 percent, and our suspicion is that the people who filled that out and said they approved didn't know what question they were actually answering. <laughs> But we can talk about polling also, if you want. You know, then there's also state policy, stuff that goes on in the state house here, and you know that has a lot to do with your reimbursements from Medicaid, with your ability to work with other clinical entities, your ability to actually um, deal with things like scope of practice and regulation of your profession, uh, and in some cases, resources to further supplement education, research, uh, and training. So whether it's at the state, national or local level, all these things can have an impact. And I'd also argue that there is a sort of a small policy uh, P that can affect you without any government involvement. Um, and I'll give you as an example of that. In uh, 2006, the AAMC looked at where we were going with workforce projections and decided that, you know what, we really needed to ramp up the training of more physicians, in addition to more nurses and PAs and social workers and direct care workers, but our sort of sphere of influence was physicians. So we developed a policy that our medical school membership 
ought to expand enrollment by 30% through new and existing schools. Uh, and nobody passed a law saying they had to do that. We made a recommendation to our membership. We showed them the data. They're data-driven individuals and institutions, and we're on track to meet that goal now. And one of the challenges is we also recommended to the federal government that they get rid of the cap on funding for residency training positions, and so now we're at a bit of a collision point. So not everybody listens to us. Uh, sometimes that's selective. But just a little bit about who we are so you know um, what we think about. We represent the 141 U.S. MD institutions like Baylor. We also represent uh, almost 400 major teaching hospitals and health systems, and that includes in those institutions between academic societies and our faculty um, 120,000 physicians, another almost 120,000 physicians in training, and over 80,000 medical students. So at any given time, academic medicine has 300,000 physicians or physicians to be, and that's a large voice. Imagine if you could get that voice to speak as one within the House of Medicine. That would be pretty powerful, larger than any other uh, specialty medical society out there. And we also deliver, through our institutions and our faculty, over 20% of all the clinical care in the country. So that's a big, big chunk of uh, what's good and what's bad about the American healthcare system. And that can help leverage our ability to get policymakers to listen to us and our opinions and our priorities. And as you know, we also do over half of all the NIH-funded extramural research. And so some members of Congress just think of NIH as this campus up in Bethesda and don't understand that the work is getting done all around the country in Texas and California and Massachusetts uh, and in academic centers uh, all over. And the other thing is that, you know, if you think about the economic impact, uh, our institutions collectively have an economic impact of about half a trillion dollars a year, right? And we employ directly, so not even including indirect employment, 1.9 million people. So we're a very large part of the economy. And even if uh, I were to go talk to somebody from the Texas delegation, the first thing I would say is, oh, by the way, TMC is the largest employer with 106,000 people whose jobs are on the line if you get this wrong. And so all of these things are ways that we can help um, not only shape the dialogue, but help people listen to us uh, and understand that what we have to say is important. All of this is in the context of what we do within our missions, and it's all about science and it's all about patience. And good education, good research, good care doesn't come without good science, and it's all related. But what I would say is that we know that in education, it doesn't feel that way to medical students, but uh, tuition doesn't cover the cost of medical education, and it's complex to parse all those things out. Uh, we don't want to go back to the well of asking students and other learners to take on even higher burdens of debt when they're coming out with $180,000 on average in debt now. We also know that on the graduate medical education side, people talk about Medicare's funding for GME or for residencies, but in actuality, Medicare only covers about one-fifth of all the costs of training those 115, 120,000 residents across the country. And the truth is that one of our other major missions in research we know that our NIH grants, as wonderful as they are to get and how helpful they are to conduct important work in discovery, we also lose money on those grants because we can't cover all the indirect costs. We can't cover the cost of startup packages. We can't cover the cost of recruiting and trying to support the next generation of investigators without money that's going to be there to support them for sure. So what you run into then is two out of our three missions lose money. So I would argue that if you are an educator, or if you were purely a researcher, you still need to think about the health of the clinical enterprise because that's what helps us maintain the positive health of both research and education. And so just to give you a snapshot, if you think about public payment and why all the angst over public options and the discussion of insurance, Medicaid expansion, uh, our teaching hospitals, major teaching hospitals, lose three cents on every dollar for every Medicare patient they see you know that Medicaid losses are even higher, somewhere around 20 cents on the dollar. We're providing $8 billion in charity care a year, which may or may not get better depending upon implementation of the ACA. Uh, and we don't get explicit payments in most cases for the standby care, the special capacity. We know that we have service lines clinically that lose money because we don't uh, economically value certain services, particularly cognitive services, and we have to support them because they're important to our missions and they're important to being able to train the next generation of clinicians, they have to have a full breadth of training. So all of these things are really deeply interrelated. And if you look at the budget of the average medical school, 
that's LCME accredited, half of their revenue comes from clinical enterprise funds, right? Faculty practice plan, hospital health system, and a smaller part, 20%, comes from grants and contracts. Tuition is really about 3%. Uh, there's some state support in most places that's declining. Uh, and so what we have seen over the last a um, couple of decades is that these are data from the University Health System Consortium, which looks at uh, 90 or so academic centers. Most of them are more integrated, so you've got common ownership or at least uh, you know, one major partner between a medical school and a health system. And we know that the outlays from the clinical enterprise, in this case the hospital, to the education and research missions have been going up. And on average, we're transferring over about $70 million a year in clinical revenue over to support our missions. In some of our institutions, that number is as high as $250 million a year. Okay, so we're really concerned about the viability of research not only because of the stagnation of NIH funding, but also because of our inability to leverage more income from the clinical enterprise. And so that's sort of the global picture of, of, you know, how we're looking at all of our missions moving forward. And then we've got some perennial concerns that really uh, a couple rise to the list for the association and its membership right now. And one would certainly be maintaining and expanding support for uh, residencies through GME funding uh, and also for medical research uh, primarily through NIH, but also thinking about ARC and CDC and NSF uh, and new sources like PCORI. At the same time, while we're trying to get rid of sequestration, trying to make sure that if there's only a certain amount of money available, how do we have the most flexibility in our institutions to use that to maximize uh, our ability to leverage clinical care, research, and education? The SGR, Medicare Physician Reimbursement System, every year now we've had to have a patch because of uh, a historically flawed formula that nobody has seemed to be able to address. One, because it would cost a lot of money, at last count about 170 180 billion dollars over 10 years, but also because there's a lack of great ideas about how to move to a system that rewards physicians for not just the volume of care they provide, but in some way the value. And that's one of the areas where I think Dr. Klotman and, and some of his colleagues and I had a conversation with uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Health Subcommittee this morning, Kevin Brady, and it was clear he was looking to us and saying, you need to give us some answers about what, what would you use to incentivize physicians differently? What value measures would you suggest we use? We don't want to dictate everything, but in a vacuum where policymakers don't hear from people they respect like you in the academic community, they've just got to come up with stuff themselves or take the advice of people who maybe know less about what you're doing on a daily basis. And I love, I have great friends who are health economists, but I'm telling you, they just don't have the same view of what happens when you're seeing patients or doing research on a day-to-day -day basis. We want to make sure that as, as you care about, all of your population gets great health care and we improve their health outcomes. And we've also got this added challenge of implementing some of the major changes in the ACA that are moving forward. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we help shape that. This is a, the vicious cycle of policymaking. So, from a federal standpoint, at least, what happens is somebody says, hey, I got a great idea. I'm going to do health reform. Start writing legislation. Congress passes legislation. Um, the challenge is, as many pages, 1,700 or so, that the ACA embodied, and, and all laws are like this, they don't give you all the answers. And so that law then has to go over to people in the executive branch and the administration so that they can write rules. So if I say, we should pay doctors for quality. Okay, great. What does that mean? And that means that the administration then sits down and says, okay, we're going to measure quality in such a way. We're going to use, um, you know, these NQF measures. We're going to look at efficiency by looking at Medicare spending per beneficiary. And that's another opportunity for us to shape policies to say, we think what Congress meant was this, that you ought to do it this way. And for our institutions and our patients, you can't just generically say everybody's going to have the same outcomes. Our patients tend to be sicker. We have data to show that. They have other social challenges. How are you going to address those as you write these rules? Inevitably, any administration, not just this one, will then screw it up again. And they won't interpret things correctly. And I'll give you some examples of that, which means we start this all over again. And we go back to Congress and say, hey, they didn't do what you intended. You've got to pass another law and do a fix. 
challenge that we're at right now in this particular environment is where, wherever you are on the ACA and uh, health care reform, there are problems with the law. There are problems that everybody, if you sat them down in a room, would say, we want to fix those problems. But in the current political environment, the Democrats in the Congress are essentially afraid to admit that there's anything wrong with the ACA, and so they don't want to go back to fix it. And the Republicans are afraid to admit that there's anything workable in the ACA, and they don't want to go back to fix it. So we're stuck. So historically, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, you saw major revisions and revisions year after year to these laws because mistakes are made, right? When, when we go back sometimes to people who are writing the ACA and we say, boy, how could you guys let this horrible mistake go through that's going to cost our institutions billions of dollars a year? And they say, oh, yeah, that was on a list of the stuff we were supposed to fix when we got to conference and we never got there, sorry. So this is sort of a normal process, but it's happening in a very abnormal environment right now, so that makes it much more difficult. The other thing I'll say about this sort of spectrum is whether you're doing this at the state level or trying to create change within an institution or a group of institutions, uh, there's different ways to think about this. One is to, to do kind of proactive policy, to say, I have a great idea. I have some thoughts about what we can do to fix something that people aren't even, it's not even on their radar yet, right? So I think we actually need to worry about um, you know, changes to uh, how we support folks who are falling through the safety net and how that affects their health status. Great. You go have conversations with people, you think about the merits of the idea, and then they're going to ask you, okay, what law could I pass that would fix this? Right? So that's a very proactive approach to policy. Another is uh, still proactive to say we know that something is going to be discussed. Let's get our homework done. And create a body of research so that we can go up and provide some input. Then there's somewhat collaborative policy, which is if you think about what our association did with lots of physicians and trainees um, that work in our institutions and our practice plans and our medical schools, SGR is not necessarily our first priority, but it's something that we care a lot about. And so we would then collaborate with groups like the AMA and the ACP and the ACS to make sure that we could all speak as much as possible with one voice on how to fix that. And then there's reactive policy where, unfortunately, more and more of our time is spent with people who say, I have a great idea. They try to put it into a bill, and you have to go in and convince them, this is not a great idea. Here's all the things that would happen that you haven't considered. So ideally, you want to be as proactive as possible, and I think that would be one of the goals of having an institute here is to say, what are the things that we believe need to be changed, need to be affected, that will help our patients and our community that no one is talking about? How can we build a literature up? And sometimes, you know, this can take years. So there are sort of things that you can do and say, I'm going to build up the data to make my case around a particular policy. And in other cases, you have to do it more on the fly. All this still is affected by politics, and I don't know if there's any etymologists in the audience, but most of us have taken some Latin going through medical training, and you know that the uh, root of the word poly uh, is Latin for many, and uh, you may not be aware of the etymology of ticks, which essentially means blood-sucking parasites, <laughs> which is a fair characterization of what goes on most days. And that politics is not just between Democrats and Republicans. Um, I would love for us to be able to go up as AAMC and say, look, Baylor College of Medicine, TMC, you know, all of our teaching hospitals and med schools across the country and our docs and our researchers think you should do this. A lot of other folks, they're just the people I could fit on one page, whether that's pharmaceuticals or device make manufacturers, hospital associations, physician associations, uh, individual uh, patient groups, et cetera. And, you know, again, when we're talking about something like the NIH budget, what we want to do is create as many coalitions as possible. Can we get agreement among the patient care groups and among the scientists that now is not the time to be up in Congress saying we, we should direct X amount of funding towards pancreatic cancer research or we should direct X amount of funding towards neurologic disease. We need to agree and just go in there and say we need to invest in discovery and biomedical research. So that's something that we also have to be very careful of as we craft our policy statements. I'll give you a couple of examples from healthcare reform um, about how policy can be done proactively and sometimes done reactively. 
Before the president was even elected uh, in the spring of 2008, the leadership at the AAMC got together and said, something's coming. Doesn't matter who gets elected. There's too many people talking about reform and insurance reform. We need to make sure we're ready. So by the spring of 2008, before the general elections were even held, we created, uh, with the agreement of our board, principles for health care reform. And they were very mom and apple pie kind of things that you, know, you would look at and say, yeah, I think people agree with that. We want to insure as many people as possible. We want to make sure that you don't dismantle the things that are in place to take care of the most vulnerable before you institute a new system. We want to ensure an investment in discovery and research so that we can keep advancing American medicine. And we want to make sure that we train an adequate generation of health professionals to take care of all these people that we're promising insurance to. So nothing really out of what most of us, I think, would agree upon, but it laid out a set of stakes that we could put in front of policymakers to say, these are the things we're going to be watching you on. There's stuff that you, know, you may want to do on device manufacturers or pharma. Or we're, going to, we're going to not get into that fray, but we laid out a marker for what we cared about and let them know that they had to come consult us if they were going to touch any of these areas. The president got elected in the fall, and then in January of 2009, before he was even inaugurated, we held a series of fly-in meetings with deans and CEOs across the country, some done in collaboration with the American Hospital Association, because we knew that as the president ran on a health care reform platform, they were going to be looking for money. And one of the places that they typically look for money is in graduate medical education funding. Lots of proposals have been out there before. Uh, and we did everything we could to make sure that that was taken off the table. And so all of our deans and CEOs and others sent that message out. The Finance Committee, charged in the Senate with writing a draft of this bill, put out a series of white papers. So not actually writing legislation, but just some ideas to float out there. I think they put out three white papers. And in one of them, they listed, well, maybe we could mess around with this GME funding to teaching hospitals and use some of that money to get insurance for people and use that to fix the SGR. And we said, wait a minute. We told you this is not the area to go to. We are going to take care of those patients. Sometimes we're the only ones who will. We need to be able to train people and provide the services to do that. We got champions in the Senate, uh, Schumer, Kyle of Arizona, who basically said, that goes off the table, otherwise you will not have our votes on any bill that comes out. And so that was a, a very striking way early on of saying, we tried to be proactive, say stay away from this. We had to be reactive, but then we found a way to get that off the table, only to fight lots and lots more battles. Other things that we talked about um, during the, the crafting of healthcare reform, uh, comparative effectiveness research and the creation of PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, uh, widely lambasted as you know a way towards rationing and death panels, et cetera. Um, but you know we're researchers. We we wanted uh, that investment in in health services research. But there was a big debate about how transparent will we be with data. How much uh, did the government have control over this versus a private independent entity. And one of the things we said is we believe in the peer review process. We have an infrastructure in place. We don't think you should be duplicating the entire structure of HHS, NIH, and ARC in another program. And so we have won that one. But again, these are the kind of details that uh, you have to just keep watching for in a 1,700-page bill. And the messages that came through that they were trying to achieve in, in ACA, and I think that they would be trying to do in any kind of health care reform from either party is how do we align the behavior of different sectors of the healthcare system? How do we align research with the needs of a population? And quite frankly, anybody walking on this campus would say, okay, you've got a thousand physicians in a practice plan across the street from a thousand bed hospital. You guys ought to be able to figure this out. I mean, forget about all those onesie twosie practices out there and little community hospitals. You need to figure this out. And I think it's even a challenge for us, uh, despite how much we love each other and share the same missions, it's a challenge. And I, I would say that one of the biggest challenges has been, um, even before getting to aligning physicians, hospitals, post-acute home health, is aligning physicians themselves. Right? So does our practice plan actually have one 
common bottom line? Or are we all still living in a world where we eat what we kill? Right? Are we aligned as physicians uh, before we go out and try and align with anybody else? Lots of discussion around paying for value, paying for quality, not paying for volume. And so you'd think, well, that'd be pretty easy then. Raise your hand if you're for, for value. Okay, raise your hand if you're against waste. Okay, so we simply pass a law that says the administration shall create a reimbursement scheme that will reward value and punish waste. You know, waste is, uh, to one man, somebody else's profit. Or it may also be waste is the higher amount of resources you spend on vulnerable populations. And so another interesting thing that we observed during healthcare reform is what percentage of healthcare spending in this country is wasted? Do we have a number? 50. A third, 50, okay, where is that based on? Obama told me. <laughs> and you trusted him. Anybody else? Get it from a different source than the president? Okay, so then you're talking about health policy and public health policy. So if you look at the rankings of the U.S. compared with other OECD countries, where do we, where do we rank poorly? Where do we rank well? Access, we're bad. Longevity, some mortality. Mortality overall, yes. Mortality from homicide, suicide in particular. Um, we have the world's best five-year survival for breast cancer. Pretty good for colorectal cancer. Pretty good for, I mean, when people get really sick all over the world, where do they fly? Aha. Uh -huh. So part of this is also explaining to policymakers, are you comparing apples and apples? And what I always explain to people is if you look at those other OECD countries, the next ones down are Norway and France in terms of their spending, and look at what they spend on clinical care, yes, they're spending a little more than half as much of their GDP on clinical care. But look at how much they spend on social welfare and health. Education, poverty reduction, maternal paternal leave, disability policy. And so my argument would be, if you look at our Medicare population, they do very well. So it turns out that if you do everything possible for somebody when they turn 65, they get pretty good outcomes, right? We have problems with overuse in some cases, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to that. But I don't think it's a surprise that if you ignore people from birth to 64, they don't do so well, right? So, but that becomes a health problem, and that's something that I think most policymakers don't think about. But then what's the science we need to rectify that? If we, if we really want to outlive other countries and be less obese than other countries, how much does it have to do with what you and I might do as a physician in the office versus what we do in school and in a public health department and in a lot of other places? So, you know, all these things became very, very um, controversial in some ways. And you're right. The 30% came from the president. It came from the president who got an article from the New Yorker written by Atul Gawanda that basically said, why is spending in McAllen, Texas, 30% more than it is in El Paso or somewhere else? And that came from the Dartmouth Atlas. And so here's another interesting story. The Dartmouth Atlas was started 30-some years ago by Jack Wenberg, uh, and then carried forward by uh, Elliot Fisher and David Goodman and others at, at uh, the Dartmouth Institute. And essentially what they said was, in the last six months of life, or the last two years of life, some places spend more money on Medicare beneficiaries before they die. So let's start at death and work backwards. And look at a map of the country. If you come to the workshop later, I'll show you the maps. They're fascinating. And it showed that the brown places, the very darkly shaded places, were bad. They were inefficient. If they just spent 30% less and we gave that money to the efficient places, we could have better outcomes for less costs. Where were those places? Big cities with diverse populations, Gulf states, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, New York, Los Angeles, 
Philadelphia, the really um, efficient places, Idaho Falls, um, Minnesota, La Crosse, Wisconsin. My in-laws live in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The cow species there are more diverse than the human species. <laughs> Right? And I love lacrosse, but it's just different. And so once there was some work done, again, this is where we play defense to actually look at those spending differences, IOM, CMS, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, some other smart folks said, um, you know what? It turns out we're spending more because the patients that live in these places are sicker. Now, is there still overuse there? Yes. Is there waste there? Yes. Is there underuse there? Yes. But so all this becomes very complicated. And I would say it's your job as people who combine research and clinical care to give us some guidance on how we parse that out. Otherwise, we literally have a bunch of health economists sitting there looking at maps saying, well, they spend more there. That must be waste. So I think that's part of the thing that you need to be thinking about is where can you actually add your voice to this? Um, again, comparative effectiveness. How are we actually uh, evaluating our treatments our diagnostics. Um, lots of talk of accountability. And I think on the physician side, there were some tweaks in there. The big thing that was supposed to get done was addressing the Medicare SGR. Never got done. We're still having that conversation. Had the conversation this morning. There was some discussion around wringing your hand saying, well, we don't pay primary care or other cognitive services well enough, so they gave them a pay increase in Medicaid for two years. Great, I still don't know what my payment's gonna be in 2015 if I'm practicing a lifetime of being a generalist uh, with not a whole lot of guidance as to what it would be. Um, right now it's linked to the Physician Quality Reporting System, PQRS. It's only at 1%. It'll probably get dialed up in the future. Um, but I worry about our ability to risk adjust properly. So think about the patients that you see in your clinic or in the inpatient setting and how different they are from somebody who is seeing a patient at a community hospital or a private doctor's office uh, a couple miles out. And our ability to measure those differences is, I would say, relatively nascent. So again, this gets back to how do we come up with quality measures that match the patients that we take care of and can appropriately risk adjust? And that's a big task ahead. Hospitals, if you want to know what the hospital CEOs are worried about out of ACA, the biggest thing up front is we had to fund insurance expansion. We had to come up with the money somewhere. Some came out of the device companies, some came out of Medicare Advantage insurance plans, some came out of uh, other uh, providers. $155 billion came out of hospitals, including $40 billion in special payments called disproportionate share payments that are made to help offset the care to uninsured and underinsured patients. Right? So it's a, a bucket of money that if you in a hospital are seeing patients that come in uninsured, you have to see them, take care of them. This is meant to uh, help make you whole. And so the theory was, well, if we're going to insure everyone, you won't need that money. And so we said, OK, in theory, we agree, but let's show that this works first. And that has just become something that's uh, of great uncertainty as now states have the option not to expand Medicaid and we potentially lose 16 million out of 32 million people we intended to get insured. Um, we just don't know how the math is going to work out. All of these cuts, will they actually be matched by increases in coverage? And if we actually cover people that are going to Ben Taub or somewhere else and they get insurance, are they still going to want to go there? Or will they take their paying business somewhere else. So I think all of these are unknowns that, that keep a lot of our uh, health system administrators up at night. Then there are policies which are meant to reward value, things like value-based purchasing. A little tricky for us because 30% of that score is on patient satisfaction. And turns out some people in some parts of the country are crankier than others. And some people have legitimately worse facilities and don't have private rooms and, and that all affects things. One of them is, are people aware of the readmissions penalties at all? Seeing some not. So great idea here. Uh, take a couple of conditions. Start out with acute MI, heart failure, uh, and pneumonia. And you know, Dr. Klotman comes in, and uh, he's got heart failure, and, and I tune him up, and uh, I just send him out in his merry way. He doesn't do so well. He comes back in three or four days later. And I think what Medicare is, the payer is legitimately saying is, well, you guys screwed up on Klotman. Why should we pay you the same amount again to just repeat the mistake? Fine in theory. Here's the challenge of that. Under the current way that the administration 
interpreted the readmissions policy, Dr. Klotman comes in with heart failure, give him some tender love and care and a lot of Lasix, a little education, send him out. He feels so good that two weeks later, he's on his bike and one of your Houston SUVs runs him over and he ends up at Ben Taub in the trauma center. That's a readmission. That's, that's an avoidable readmission and the hospital will be penalized for this. So it's all in the details. You can affect policy. That's just the, the beginning of the game is when you pass a law. But so here's what our 260 hospitals only, member hospitals, are looking at. Between productivity cuts, updates in market basket, um, uh, inflation updates, uh, value-based purchasing penalties, readmission penalties, dish payment cuts, we're looking at $2.5 billion coming out of 260 major teaching hospitals over the next decade year to year. Terrible. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to pray that eventually people come into Medicaid, the exchanges work, we can make up those losses. Then we throw in sequestration. And all of a sudden, the cuts that come into the hospital, to the practice plan, and to the NIH budget and other federal grants start to pile up to above to $4 billion a year. And so we have looked at all the other proposals floating around in Congress, and unfortunately, every other kind of best case scenario shows about the same picture. A loss of close to one third of any of the clinical margins that on average our institutions are making, making less money available for research and education. So this is kind of the new normal that we're living with. At the same time, we're being asked to transition to a very different type of healthcare system. Uh, and I do think that as much as we get criticized for being ivory towers and not being engaged in system reform, um, the bulk of the innovation grants went to academic institutions. They are 38% uh, of the pioneer ACOs, many of the other accountable care organizations. Um, and so I, I, I think we are poised to lead. But again, how do we figure out which one of these different uh, payment systems will work for academic medicine? And just. I want to just give you some data on this, again, that you, know, you want to get rid of unnecessary readmissions, but it turns out also that hospitals that keep their patients alive have lower mortality rates, have higher readmissions, right? Because you can't readmit a dead patient. <laughs> Not usually. I know you guys are getting really good at Baylor, but... So, we look at the data, so let's look at the places in the country where readmissions are highest. Chicago, I think that's a place that the administration is familiar with. <laughs> Lowest readmission rates are in Idaho Falls. And look at how the populations are different. They're not as sick in Idaho. They are twice as poor in Chicago, more likely to be dual eligible. 95% of people who live in Idaho Falls are white non-Hispanic. I, I didn't know a place like that existed anymore. And Chicago is a majority minority city. And it turns out that CMS's own analysis shows that most of the readmissions increases can be tied back to minority race and um, socioeconomic status. And so we push them to say, let's, let's find a proxy to adjust for this. We're not saying we don't want to be responsible for everybody, but how do we actually not punish the hospitals and the clinicians that are trying to take care of the toughest patients? How do I? How do I ensure that I do a home visit when my patient is homeless? How do I make sure that my patient is taking their medications appropriately for heart failure when they have a dual diagnosis and they're not adequately treated on their mental health issues, right? None of this stuff was factored in. Uh, and so it turns out that, um, and again, you know, my story about uh, being hit by the SUV is a little absurd, but it turns out the majority of readmissions for all these conditions are unrelated to the primary admission. We're working on that. But so there's a lot of places where we could use your help in thinking about this. This is just showing, again, that for all conditions, um, the higher the uninsured and Medicaid percentage in a hospital, the higher the readmission rates. Um, and so we need to keep working on that. I'm going to move over to research policy for a minute because you know, there's wide agreement in general that NIH funding, research for biomedical and health services research is important. It's good for the overall long-term viability of the nation and our competitiveness. It's good for our patients that we look for cures and treatment advances. 
And so what we've gotten instead recently in discussions around funding for research has been uh, something a little more nuanced. So this is um, Majority Leader Cantor from Virginia who said there's an appropriate role or necessary role for the federal government to ensure funding for basic medical research. Good so far. But we have to reprioritize existing spending. Funds currently spent by the government on social science, politics of all things, we've better spent on finding cures to diseases. So none of this comparative effectiveness, none of this health economics. Uh, we should decide as politicians on the merits of the scientific process. And so we continually have to push back and say, you should not be micromanaging science. We have a process to do this, thank you very much. Um, but then they throw these things at you. Well, if you just take a billion dollars from you know, NSF and move it over to NIH, well, that would, that would help. And so that becomes very difficult. Um, Andy Harris, uh, he had an office next to Peter Pronovost at Hopkins for many years. He's an anesthesiologist. And he's actually been a PI on an NIH grant. So what is the NIH going to do to make sure we don't fund this research, we fund real medical research as we go forward in a time of constrained resources? So this is a tough audience of uh, people who really think that, you know, anything related to the word um, sex or, or drug use or anything is improper funding. Uh, and so there's a lot of things going on right now to try and reassure Congress about the validity of the peer review process. Uh, we're certainly putting pieces out there. Um, we're also trying to provide data. I think part of this is how do we prove to policymakers that what we're doing, particularly if they are um, peer-initiated investigations, are actually valid and have return for the public. So we've just uh, kicked off a effort to look at uh, research evaluation with RAN Europe um, to look at uh, a variety of different ways of measuring uh, return on investment uh, that if you're interested you can find. And then we have to do things like Dr. Klotman has done and many of our other leaders have done to get the word out in the press, uh, be able to give them the stories because they're the ones that are going to help shape public opinion uh, and somebody needs to back home say to Mr. Cantor or Dr. Harris, hey, I think some of this research is really important. Um, we have even started to stray into social media. So part of this again is part of making policy is having the research and the thoughtful approach to fixing a policy problem. Part of it is propaganda. Unfortunately, part of it becomes financial. Uh, so we try at least to highlight some of the work that our member institutions are doing. This is on Tumblr. It can be searched for by state, by disease. Uh, we've managed to get you know, several thousand uh, followers of, of stories that have gone viral. So really trying to highlight the work that you're doing here and across the country. But, the other thing you have to do is put it in real terms for policymakers to say cuts to NIH are bad. The fact that you know, our purchasing power hasn't gone up in a decade and it's not going to start to return to the current levels until 2017 under sequester means we have to be able to explain to a policymaker why that is bad and why we can't just be moving money around. So the kind of questions that we hope you can answer are how many faculty have stopped doing research and you know, stopped being a double or triple threat and said I've got to go earn more RVUs? How many patients are affected that you weren't able to enroll in a clinical trial? How many fewer future scientists are you now training? Um, what are the other things that have implications for patients uh, that have been eliminated? Are there scientists that are maybe came here as postdocs or doctoral students to train that have said there's no future for scientists here in the U.S. I'm going back to name your country. Um, those things, I think, overall will make a difference to members of Congress. Um, PCORI, I won't go into. One of the other things, again, how do you influence policy? So PCORI is set up with a board of governors. And one of the things that we did in the midst of the drafting of health care reform is once we knew there was going to be a PCORI and something outside of HHS or NIH or ARC, is we said, we got to get folks who understand academic medicine on that board. And in fact, got uh, Gene Washington, um, who's the uh, dean out at UCLA, as the chair. He stepped down, but we've got a psychiatrist, uh, Norquist, from uh, Mississippi that's coming on as a chair. Steve Lipstein is the CEO of BJC Healthcare System uh, that works with WashU in St. Louis as the vice chair. So again, it's important to also, for all these federal panels that get created, uh, populate them with people like you. So where are we at the end of the year? Well, again, 
we're not doing a whole lot of policy right now, but I, I think this is a great opportunity for you to start doing some of your homework, figuring out the things that you want to weigh on when people weigh in on, when people are actually ready to legislate uh, again. We have some issues where at the end of the year we're trying to pay for um, the dock fix either for 10 years at 140 to 170 billion dollars or 18 billion if we're going to do it for one year. Most often Congress just comes in and says, well, take it out of the hospital. And we sit there and we go, okay, you moved it from one side of the street to the other, but you know, you have to do what you have to do. So I would um, open it up for any discussion and questions, but I, I think as you all move forward and as you develop your policy research and your policy institute, um, one thing you want to do is, is utilize the interests and the skills of everybody at your institution and don't navigate the process alone. And the last thing you want to do is go traipsing up to Austin or to Washington, D.C. and say, hi, I'm here for Baylor College of Medicine, and I think you should do X, Y, and Z. Uh, it's not going to work out well. So you want to talk to your government relations professionals. You want to talk to your leadership and make sure you guys can go in with a coherent strategy to advocate. I think you also need to keep an eye on the ball in terms of where implementation for the things that we know are coming in ACA, how are the exchanges going to affect you? But quite frankly, let's say the exchanges get set up perfectly. What we're seeing now is that insurers that have to come in and offer a product are starting to say, well, we can't offer it at a low cost and keep places like BCM or TMC in the network. So we're not even going to tier the pricing. We're just going to keep you out of the network completely. Right? How do you, what can you do to stop that from happening? Um, how do you think about future policy issues that are going to come down the line? We are going to be asked for more quality measures. We are going to be asked how, to get, how do you pay physicians and hospitals differently. You are going to be asked, prove to me the value of your research. So how do you start thinking about answering those questions now? Because you're going to need to. Um, use rigorous research, uh, I think, but also be aware that you know, any of you that do scientific research or health services research know that people can take data and mix it any which way and change the lag time and you know, change the intervals and say, well, I, I came up with something different. So you've got to be aware that people don't always play nice, um, but be aware that you, know, you can shape that argument as well. And um, you may have to go defensive and keep an eye out for people who are going to pose things that may not be what's best for patients or what's best for academic medicine. So I will stop there, figure, give it 10 minutes for some time. If you're really interested in this stuff, we have an app for that. Thanks to Brian, I'm now tweeting. So you can, if you do Twitter, that's up there as well. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions or have any discussion.